You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. If you'd like to learn more about the Bearded Theologians, you can go online at beardedtheologians.com, where we have past podcasts, blogs, and a couple items for sale. So check us out, beardedtheologians.com. Thank you for listening, and enjoy this week's show. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. And today we have a very uh, special guest with us, friend of the podcast, uh, Kara, Reverend Kara Edson. Uh, Kara, thanks for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Would you, um, would you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you're from? Sure. I grew up in the Kansas City metro area, and um, I I returned there post-seminary. I went to Missouri State for my undergrad in Springfield, Missouri, and Duke Divinity School for seminary. Uh, But at this point in my career, that's been a while ago, I graduated from from seminary in 2007. I was ordained and an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church in 2010 um, in what then was the Kansas East Conference and is now the Great Plains Conference. And I am currently serving two small churches, um, in just kind of very close to actually where I live, just a 10 minute drive from my house. Uh, they are called McLeod United Methodist Church and uh, Oskaloosa United Methodist Church. And those are in McLeod, Kansas and Oskaloosa, Kansas. Awesome. Um, I love I love having folks on, uh, you know, with the Methodist connection and, and hearing about you know, you know, Matt's in Oklahoma, I'm out in Wyoming and, uh, our conference out here in the mountain sky is pretty expansive. Uh, but, but neighbors, you guys over in in Kansas. So it's, it's really fun, uh, to kind of see that connection and, and hear the different stories and how, how we're doing ministry and things like that. So, uh, thanks for bringing that perspective onto the podcast today. Absolutely. So, oh, go ahead, Matt. Well, I was I was just going to lead her into her book a little bit. Uh, so, um, part of the reason why we're having you on today um, is to talk about this uh, great book that you have here uh, for Lent. If you, uh, for those that are listening, if you haven't planned your Lent yet, this may be a great opportunity for you now to start planning that because it's only like two or three weeks away. So, um, but she has a great book here uh, that's uh, called A Time to Grow. Lenten lessons from the garden to the table. And so Kara, um, would you kind of, you know, share us a little bit about your book here that you've got? um, Absolutely. So my favorite two topics uh, are are God, because, you know, I'm a pastor, so I get up and talk about God about 15 minutes every Sunday morning in front of a whole bunch of people. And my one of my other favorite topics is food and discussing food and where our food comes from, how our food gets from seed to table. And uh, I love feeding people. Uh, There was a a common refrain when I was a campus minister because we frequently met at my house. And so my students often said, nobody leaves Kara's house hungry. Um, And that's just, I really love to make sure that that people are fed. Um, And that goes as a pastor, both spiritually and then also physically. Um, I'm really passionate about gardening and so passionate that my sister called me a couple of Saturday mornings ago and said, Hey, Kara, I have a couple of questions about composting. And 55 minutes later into composting, I, uh, my sister kind of interrupted me and she goes, Kara, I, I have to go now. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So, um, so I, uh, I, I can talk about uh, gardening and composting and um, growing, growing our food. And it's just something that I grew up uh, in going to my grandparents' farms in South Central Missouri. And so I was helping pick strawberries before I could pronounce the word. So even though I'm a city girl, um, kind of by, by how I was raised, I definitely have really, really deep roots uh, in the soil. I love that. I mean, those are, <laughs> you described the two best things about being a Methodist pastor, right? Yeah. Having, getting to talk about God and, and eating. Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, exactly. I think we do those two things really well a lot of yes. the time. Yes, yes. Um, and so, so I guess, you know, through the work of your book and, and putting all of this together and, and kind of taking those two passions, right? right. How, how have you seen, um, how have you seen that grow? Uh, and, and, food, right? And where it comes from, and how we get it. How have you seen that kind of grow into the spiritual part of, of people's lives, if not your own? So the book is, um, 
kind of broken up, each holy day has its own theme that comes from gardening. So things like light, water, uh, life, and then things like fast and feast, um, which are all very, very relevant if you're eating, trying to eat locally and, and resource your food locally. Um, it, I have definitely been on a, on a huge journey as far as, as just learning to garden. Uh, my grandfather, even though he was an excellent gardener, um, by the time we planted our first little little raised bed, my grandfather had actually passed away. And so there were there was all this knowledge that I did not garner from him. And luckily for me, my uh, husband's grandmother was just an amazing, amazing gardener. And so I could call up Arlene anytime and say, hey, Arlene, is it time to is it time to cover the strawberries? Is it time to uncover them? Um, should my tomatoes go in this week, next week? Because uh, anybody that lives in this part of the country knows, and, and Matt's, Matt's further south than me, but he still knows this, uh, the weather is not predictable. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> there, there are no guarantees. And so um, she was just an amazing mentor for me and in, in learning how to do that. And I think that for me, I, I came to find that in addition to obviously the, the spiritual parts of what I do professionally, that I was finding God for myself more and more frequently when I was in that quiet time in my garden, um, just growing food, weeding, um, and doing all of the, the hard work that it takes to produce that food. We actually moved, uh, my husband and I moved to a bigger piece of land three years ago because he wouldn't let me turn the entire backyard into a garden. He said we had to have some grass, which I think is overrated because I can't eat it. But uh, he he was very insistent that I couldn't turn the whole backyard into a garden. (laughs) (laughs) You know, for me growing up, uh, when we had our garden in our backyard, um, that was our outfield. Like that was like, we literally had a field of dreams type setup to where the garden, if you hit in the garden is a home run. And so like, when I think of garden, especially like backyard gardens to me, I think that's the one thing that comes to mind is that like field of dreams type, like you hit it in the garden, uh, and you better hope you don't wreck mom's tomatoes or else there's going to be, you know, there they'll be hell to pay. Um, and so, you know, as you were putting this together, um, you know, what was kind of like your biggest discovery as you were kind of crafting all this? Um, I think the one thing that I didn't even realize until my public, until my, my publisher pointed it out was that, um, that it was really, it was really amazing because as they were editing, my editor was editing. She, she pointed out to me that, that Good Friday starts in a garden and that Easter morning finishes in a garden. And I hadn't ever that hadn't, piece that together, even though I'm writing this book on Lent and gardening. And she's like, Kara, you should probably talk more about this. Um, but that those pieces of those pieces of where our food comes from and those traditions of our food are very, very much ingrained and in, in who we are and how we um, you know, there are things that you can say to somebody and, and immediately every, every person in the United States uh, that's been here for, for more than a couple of years will come up with the same answer. When you say things like, what do you eat at a birthday party? Um, you, you eat cake and ice cream, right? Like that's, that's just the standard answer. And so um, in, in, in that expansion of that theme of, of how deeply we are connected to, to what we eat and how our cultures are so deeply connected to what we eat, um, I, I came to find a really new passion for communion and, and that particular meal of when we gather around the table and um, experience God's grace together and, and just thinking through kind of the organic nature of that first, that, that first communion together with Jesus and his disciples that it wasn't this like very formal, you know, nobody put on a robe and stood up in the front with a stole and, and there weren't like fancy chalices. This was just, this was just a meal among friends. And um, I frequently experience God uh, very, very closely in, in those settings when I'm, I'm, I'm getting to host people in my house and, and provide a meal and just sit around and chat like that. That is a divine experience to me often. Mm-hmm. I, l- I love that so much. Um, I have found in my routine of, of preaching, 
uh, that often when I start a new appointment, one of the first sermon series I, I work through is, is something around food, gathering yeah. at the table. Um, and, and usually I focus on you know, meals with Jesus and all of the times that Jesus goes and eats with people and the conversations that are had or what transpires because of it. Uh, and it's not always pretty for Jesus, right? No. Sometimes he has these wonderful things and other times, uh, you know, people are standing outside pissing and moaning about a meeting with the sinners, right? Right. <laughs> and, and then, and then you, you come to the communion table, right? You come to that meal. And um, I think there's something so significant about us as people sitting around a table, mm -hmm. uh, sharing a meal, whether it's for church or, you know, spiritual reasons or gatherings or whatever, or if it's just our families or strangers yeah. or however, there, there's something about a table with food on it, <laughs> with food and drink on it that breaks down barriers and makes us, makes us human, makes us yeah. people. Um, and, and thinking about, about communion and the way that we come to the communion table, I've served all over Texas and New Mexico and Montana and Wyoming now, and everybody comes to the table a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, I served these three churches in Montana and the first time I did uh, communion in them, uh, the, my, my littlest church out there, uh, we go through the liturgy, we do the things and, you know, I give the directions of, you know, you, you get, there's 15 of them in the room, right? And it's like, well, just, just come up and we'll serve you. They ignored all of that because their tradition was to come up, kneel around uh, on the kneeling rail and serve each other, send them out with a blessing. They didn't tell me any of that. They just, <laughs> that's, but that's what they did, you know, right. and, and we learned really quickly doesn't care what instructions I give. This is what we do and how we come to the table. It was awesome, you know, and it, it gave me a new, uh, really loosened me up in that understanding of, no, it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to, we don't have to do the things, the table, the invitation, the receiving and the, the sending is, is huge, right? It's those relationships that we build there and, and come humbly to the table, wherever it is and how, wherever it is. Yeah. Um, I love that. And, and it's food. Yeah. <laughs> it's a meal, right? And and right. It, and no matter what that meal is, whether it's communion or you know, uh, barbecue or a burger or whatever, right? It's the meal that sets the table for us, which I think is really cool. And that's one thing I, you know, I I did actually a I I led a, a book study group uh, just a few days ago that we're getting ready to start reading this for for the season of Lent, and and I asked the ladies that were in the group, I said, you know, can you what is your what is your like kind of strongest food memory from your childhood. And, and we could have been there all day um, hearing those stories. And, and those are all stories that we have. Those are stories that, that touch us very deeply. And, and if we can think through those stories, not only as, as food memories, but also kind of how does that impact our spiritual life? Um, that can be a really big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you're right. I mean, we, being, <laughs> serving regionally like I have and, and have, have had the opportunity and privilege to uh, be all over. Um, Montana, you have a really big Scandinavian uh, yeah. Lutheran culture and Lutefisk every year, you know, our, <laughs> my parsonage is a house down from the Lutheran church and every fall my house smelled like riding fish because that's what, but that's what, and they, the community Lutheran or not looked forward to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we did the, the, as the Methodist church, we had a, uh, you know, roast, uh, what did we do? We did pork and roast beef, yeah. uh, or brisket, or, you know, we, we did a meal like that in again, everybody and every little community like that had their meal. Uh, we had a German community that did a German meal and, and we planned really tried to plan well so that you could hit, we weren't planning on top of each other so that the communities right. could be involved with one another. Um, because they looked forward to it and it brought those memories back from, you know, the grandparents or, you know, their childhood or, you know, even last year, but right. it was really interesting leaving the South and going way North and seeing the different, seeing a different tradition of food and, and excitement around that and help me, help remind me of the experiences I had in, in Texas and New Mexico of, oh no, we have this too. You know, it, it was just yeah. enchiladas or it was brisket or, you know, whatever. It was just a yeah. little different. It wasn't right so fish. <laughs> when I was when I was two and my mom was pregnant with my, my little sister, 
my mom couldn't keep down any protein. She had like morning sickness almost all the way through her pregnancy. And she, she gave birth to my sister when I was about 10 days before my, my third birthday. So, um, during that, that span that she was pregnant, um, one of the only ways she could keep down protein was she would eat malto meal and she would crumble up bacon in it because she could keep malto meal down. And so that was what she fed me every morning for most of that pregnancy. And it's a very weird dish. And yet to this day, when I'm sick or when I'm really, really sad, the only thing I want is malto meal with crumbled up bacon, which my husband finds bizarre. He's, he's like, that is just weird. Um, and, and then when I was going to school out in North Carolina, they don't, they don't sell malto meal in North Carolina, you can't get it. And this was in the days before, you know, you could just go online and order food. And so I would, I would stock up on malt meal when I went home. And then, um, just a little tip for, for anybody listening, uh, don't try to put malt meal in your carry on because they check it. Cause it's like a weird, like box of powdered substance that they can't identify when it goes mm-hmm. through the, the x-ray machine. And so you always get your bag checked. If you have a, if you have a box of malt meal in your carry on, just just so folks know. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, a TSA FYI on the podcast today. <laughs> right, maybe that's been your problem this whole long. You've been carrying that multi-meal with you for, you know, every I time you fly. I have a high yeah. rate of getting searched at airports <laughs> all my life. All of my maybe life. that's it. You need to, you need to, you need to just start it's shipping the multi meal at home. <laughs> just, just start shipping it to wherever you're yep. going. So it's there when you yep. arrive and yep. yeah, that's probably what I should do. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I love that. I, fried okra is for us. Yeah. Um, we can get it in Cheyenne at some places, but further north than this, they're like, we don't, we don't know what that is. Well, and, and for us, it's been, you know, uh, moving back into my home area um, now, now, now reservation land. Uh, 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 I've introduced my wife to bologna and have, oh. um, showed her some of the ways, not all the ways, there's still a few things I'm holding up my sleeve for later, um, on the ways of bologna. And, uh, that's definitely been some interesting conversation because it's not something she grew up with. Um, and, uh, definitely a native treat in some ways. And when, when people are hearing you're having bologna, they will come over. (laughs) Um, and so, you know, I always find, I always find that, that, um, for me, um, I came to church. One of the reasons why I came to church is because I was given zebra cakes every Sunday for Sunday school when I was a youth. Um, the very first time that I went as a teenager, I was like 16 years old. Uh, the woman had zebra cakes there and they were there every Sunday, regardless of who was teaching. Cause I had a team of four. And so each week there were, you know, hostess cakes or zebra cakes or donuts. And that was a real reason why I went because in my family at the time, my parents were both ill and weren't, able to do some of that stuff and you know I, I was picked up by a friend and and went to church and you know it was really the the food that kept me going and you know the, obviously there are a lot of other things too but um I'm a big proponent of making sure that food is part of our experience because one it made such an impact on me um and my you know even in campus when I was in college you know I would attend every campus ministry that had food um you know and had my meals planned around the different Mm -hmm. campus ministries whether I agreed with them or not um and I think that um you know now with COVID and stuff that's changed you know we've had to kind of think rethink some of that but I also feel like that that's still very central to who we are Um, is the meal. I mean, the gospel of Luke is all about Jesus going around eating and and drinking and hanging out with people. And um, it, it kind of just blows my mind how often we forget that the meal is the probably one of the most central points of who we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you were talking about different communion traditions, Zach, there's like so many different places I want to go right at the moment. (laughs) Uh, Matt first, like uh, on your social media, you're always posting like smoked bologna. And like, so I, 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 that's not the first time I've heard about it because you, you've been posting about it for years, but I will confess that I'd never heard of, of, of of smoking bologna prior to, to my interactions with you. It's the the only way you can make it edible. I mean, really. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and my I, I will admit my smoked bologna casserole that I have developed is is a treat is a tasty treat um, and uh, other people would disagree with me on that but yeah it uh, <laughs> you haven't even had it so you don't even know I don't need to <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what's, 
what's really fun is that the Wesley Foundation is that every week, every finals week, I, I'll do about seven or eight loaves, depending on what Shanna can get to me. And that uh, meal, when that bologna is served, is probably the best attended meal and the yeah. fastest that they run out of food because everybody's like, you know, it's it's kind of a regional thing. <laughs> and so, right. so yeah. Right. Well, and then the other thing was when Zach, when you were talking about communion traditions, um, and I tell this story actually in the book about communion, but I had uh, one of the churches I served, there was, um, I guess he would have been eight at the time, an eight-year-old boy that he loved the communion bread and he just thought it was the most delicious thing in the world. And so this one Sunday, he like sneaks around the back of the sanctuary and gets back in the communion line because there were two lines. And so he gets in the, in the other line and, and he takes communion again. And then he comes, uh, comes up to me after the service is over and he's like, Pastor Kara. And it was like, you know, like that, I have something to confess kids voice. And I was like, yeah, yeah. What's up? And he goes, I took communion twice. And I was like, that's awesome. More grace, more, yeah, the, the more grace, the better. And so the very next Sunday that we did communion, um, he led this like troop of other boys around the church and they ran around the back of the church once they received communion in the first line to, to get in the second line. And um, I had I had a couple of folks that were, were not happy about that because they thought the kids were, were treating communion as a boy. And um, I, I said, no, no, like I want them to know that this is this is endless grace, that this is there's an endless supply of this. And you know what? Even if they can't articulate what communion means right now, I want them to know that they are always welcome at the table as many times as it takes. And um, I had some pushback about that because mm -hmm. some folks thought the kids weren't taking it seriously. Right. So, and that kind of reminds me of my first time I ever took communion. I wasn't, I had only been to the church once before this and, and um, I was walking up with the youth because that's what, you, you know, at that time, that's what we did. You know, you, right. you took communion together regardless and so we're standing there and i remember like leaning in to one of the pastor's daughters like so it's the body and the blood and you're okay with this <laughs> like you're, you're okay with being cannibalistic like i mean i like you know uh, i was a non-believer like to me this was just so foreign and she's like it's yeah. just grace like it's grace and you'll yeah. like it and so <laughs> <laughs> um and 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 i always remember that because i always remember just that um, I always try to make sure when I make that invitation that it's not my table, it's not the church's table, it's the Lord's table. And it doesn't matter where you are or who you are, you are welcome here. And, and I think um, in the church, sometimes we forget that because we want to put up those barriers or we want to have like, like you had said, you know, people were concerned about, you know, uh, you know, but those boys are always going to have that memory. I mean, yeah. and, 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 you know, those are those things we need, man, that's how we carry on the faith is through those things, yeah. Yeah. not the, can they recite John three sixteen frontwards, right. backwards in English, Spanish, Cherokee, whatever. Um, but can, you know, do you have an experience of faith that is, you know, healthy and, you know, can be life-giving and not just life off-putting. Right. And, and I, and I say that because I remember um, Sunday, sorry, Saturday night, I was preparing communion for church on Sunday and we do it. Um, we, we prepackage ours. So we do, we have little, little tubs like everybody else is kind of doing now where we do communion, where we do the juice and then the deal. And I had it all finished and, and I had, um, the Hawaiian bread still sitting there, you know, uh, you know, just kind of sitting there. So I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. And before I could, I had came back and cleaned up some things and came back, both my children were like, had already devoured it and they're like this is communion bread that's good we're eating it and you know i want i want my i want you know i want people to remember those things and when they see those symbols they remember it and it remind it makes that reconnection to god and yeah. however you know whatever things we can do and and i think that you know definitely meals and food and all this stuff is is key to that definitely definitely i love that the girls were like we're eating this. <laughs> oh, it was up, yeah. Yeah. And, and I have to a bit, solid pastor kid move. <laughs> they are also yeah. very snobbish when it comes to grape juice and they will only drink Welch's. That's it. Oh, I mean, good they, Methodists. Are, they are very <laughs> snobby when it comes to their grape juice. And they had to tell grandparents not to buy the off brand, but they only drink mm. Welch's. 
<laughs> love it. I love it. Your your girls are uh, are, are grape juice connoisseurs. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm I'm gonna go on a limb and say uh, project onto your book a little bit, <laughs> but I, there's such an importance, right, in in how we connect all of these things whether it's food or, um, you know, coming to church or whatever our experience is, there's, there's that underlying connection that allows that grace to, to move and flow within us um, in those moments of the boys coming back around, right? Um, and, and the church going, well, we can't do this. I don't know. It's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, yeah. This, if, if you want to see, you know, a tangible picture of grace, here it is right? <laughs> you know, it, it, and whether it's that or how, how we feed people and bring, you know, college students in or youth or do potlucks, you know, every now and then we get grumpy about potlucks because well, what does a potluck do? It's not serving our community. It's not doing this and that. And, you know, I hear that argument every now and then when, when folks get grumpy in the, in the church and it's like, well, but we're feeding people. We're building relationships. We're coming together. And, and there's something there yet it may not look like it serves this over here yet but it will you know in in how do we break begin to break down those barriers to say no they shouldn't come back around for seconds to let's all go through the line until it's gone right wow. and let's all come to the table and let's all see what happens because of it um i think in, in looking at it you know, through a Lytton study of we start in a garden and we end in a garden, both in not, not fun ways, right? Uh, and not super, <laughs> they're tough. Lent, Lent's a tough season. And sometimes that's what it looks like to come, come to the table. Uh, it's tough. Sometimes there's joy and celebration. Sometimes we're not sure why we're there. And other times we're there to, to grieve. Uh, and to hurt and, and seeking healing. And I think there's really something significant in those moments that we allow people uh, the space to be where they need to be, come through the line again, uh, sit at the table, whatever it is. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of, of Ash Wednesday and of Good Friday is that we, for one thing, culture has zero interest in monopolizing those holidays uh, those, right. those, <laughs> because they are in no way sexy. Um, yeah. I am dust and to dust I shall return. No one wants to put that on a greeting card. Mm -hmm. um, but the other piece of that is that that those are days that we recognize that part of being human, mm -hmm. like that brokenness, that that grief, that it sucks to be mortal and that everyone I love is going to one day die. Like that mm -hmm. is not good news. Right. Um, and, and, and to recognize and live in that space of, of what it means to be human, um, I, I think gives people, gives people space mm -hmm. to, to feel those feelings that we all feel, but that when we're all, you know, yay, Jesus, uh, we don't necessarily inhabit that space or we're not given permission to inhabit that space. And so I think that I, I really love Ash Wednesday and Good Friday as, as, a, as a pastor, even though they're both very, I, I feel myself like very weighed down on those days. I, I It's not a, like, I just want to go home and sleep when they're mm -hmm. over. And because I'm so kind of emotionally invested in, in what it is that we're doing. But I think that, that it's so important to give folks that space of, mm -hmm. of those basic honorings and recognitions of, of what it is to be human. Right. Well, and I, I, I too love those services. And I love to throw Monday, Thursday in there also. Yeah. It, it's not as, it's not a grieving service, but it is. Yeah. It's yeah. a reminder of that humility and the humanity that we have you know we're all peter in those moments of no <laughs> you're not going to wash my feet let me wash yours and and just no here's here's what we're going to do and sit down it's grace and you're going to like it right <laughs> let me show you how and and it's just another step into that leading into the humanity uh in humility that we're that we're called to um, and, and I love it when churches are like, no, we just do Monday, Thursday, cause it's the happier service. Is it, is it happier? It's really not. If we take a really deep dive into what Jesus is doing there, it kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying goodbye. Right. 
right yeah. and 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 in such a way that it's i'm leaving now it's your turn yeah and that's heavy stuff uh and and it just it's not downhill from there it's been going downhill for a bit right that grief has been building and and i always always look at that that at monday thursday is not a starting point but almost a tipping point to oh here we go uh yeah. here's the heaviness and and it's not it's in the fullness of who who jesus is you know life death and yeah. resurrection yeah. and so i i love that connection piece uh, as a pastor it's it's funny that you mentioned that too because monday thursday the theme in the book is for monday thursday is remember mm. um and in in the the book i talk about the fact that my grandmother and i always made the dressing at thanksgiving which for those who aren't from this region dressing is is stuffing but you don't put it inside the bird <laughs> I always had to explain that when I moved to Montana. They, my yes. wife was like, they don't know what dressing yes. is. <laughs> yeah. 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 So dressing is like stuffing, but you don't put it inside. It's the yes. same thing. Um, and so grandma and I always made that. And it was a, it was this really special tradition because I started making that with her when I was eight. And, and I was very fortunate. I didn't lose my grandmother until I was in my mid thirties. And, and so we would do this together every, every Thanksgiving. And it wasn't a recipe, but it was a, it was a learned recipe, right? It wasn't something that was written down. You learned it by taste and by, by feel and by, by sight. And then when she died, um, I realized I was the only person in the family that knew how to make it. And, and my family is this big extended, you know, cousins, aunts, uncles, and so I started teaching one of my cousin's kids how to make it every year. And when we do that, we, we tell these stories, you know, I tell her stories about her great grandparents, um, who she, she barely remembers because, because she wasn't very old when they died. Mm -hmm. And then I go on to tell her stories too, about, about silly things her dad did. Uh, cause he's, he's a year older than me. So we grew up together, um, and just goofy stuff he did in his childhood. And it's this, this remembrance, uh, and there's, it's tainted with grief. Mm -hmm. um, as, as we talk about, you know, grandma, great grandma who, who taught me how to do this. And so I think that there's always that, that peace when we're remembering as humans, that, that it's always going to be tinged with a little bit of grief yeah. because at a certain age, you know, it's just inherent that, that, that some of those people that we love and some of those people who are really important to us are not going to be a part of our lives anymore. Right. Right. So um, to kind of um, wrap things up a little bit, um, what, what was there, is there any like way we can point people to the book or like, where's the best place to order it for you? Yes. Um, um, uh, anything else you want to talk about the book? Uh, you oh. know, kinda, you know, kind of that sort of thing, you know? Yes. So if we can, if we can do the one, like, this is actually a huge, huge topic. So I know we won't be able to get into it very in depth. Uh, but there, I do talk about in the book a lot about the justice issues behind food as well. And I address a lot of justice issues because the, the layers of injustice in our food system are, are bountiful and the layers of sin in our food system are bountiful. And so in, I talk about um, the ways that, that folks can try to make a difference in the injustices in our food system, in their own communities, um, and even in their own households. So one of the things I talk about is learning to compost and, and cutting down on your, on, your, on your carbon footprint as far as what goes into the landfill, talking about um, if you're in a place where there are food deserts, trying to, to make a difference in, in those resolving some of those, those, those barriers to getting fresh and healthy food. Um, yeah, there's a whole list of things about, you know, learning your resources for eating local, even if you're not going to garden, even if this isn't your thing and you don't want to grow your own food, there are still ways that you can, you can do this and, and you can approach, um, creation care and taking care of God's creation in, in a really, really powerful, um, and, and meaningful way. No, and that's a really, that's such an important, important thing because, of everything you just said, right? And not only are we abusing creation resources, right? In the fullness of, of what God and, and who God has created. But um, I did a lot of work in my undergraduate about people resources and how we abuse people. And, uh, and if you even scratch the surface on that, it's food industry, 
right? That's yeah. almost always where it begins and you see the most or see a lot of abuse and oppression and uh, the justice issues that we find that are then systemic throughout the rest of uh, everything that we do, right? And so, so even just the minimal awareness of that can can help us begin to as people in our everyday lives do small things to counteract that right. um and and that's you know there's always a starting point right and yeah. uh and that's what i hope uh, especially on that issue of, of of food deserts and just injustice to workers and things how do we start with just baby steps and yeah. make differences where we can and that's making that's different food choices too, trying right. very hard to make sure that we're eating food that's that's resourced from people who are pay, paid a fair and living wage, who right. are working in healthy, um, non-dangerous circumstances. And and part of that is is, is a privileged perspective. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in a place where you can choose what you what you eat, mm -hmm. um, and I and I do recognize that as well. But for for those of us who are in that position, um, there there is an obligation there. Um, that's not just a let's save the whales kind of thing, but right. that is an actual, we are responsible for caring for God's creation and for God's children. Well, and I always found that interesting too. Um, this, that whole idea really came to mind when I lived in a community that really didn't have any access yeah. to that stuff. Now, you know, we were a farming community, so there was some of that, but you know, like being able to have a grocery store in town, you know, not having that, that, I mean, gosh, man, like you want to talk about the the difference between kids actually getting something and, you know, having accessibility to food um, versus, you know, the only thing that they know is what they can get at the convenience store. Um, and, and seeing that play out um, definitely has been kind of something I've been trying to work with and work, you know, help bridge those gaps. Um, in my previous appointment, actually, where I met you, Kara, one of the things that we did is we ran this program where um, we it was a fitness program where we would teach kids how to be fit and everything and eat healthy. And we partnered with a grocery store to give us fruit and vegetables that the kids would never have the opportunity to taste and get the opportunity to taste what a dragon fruit tastes like and stuff like that. Because, you know, sometimes they don't, ha they've never didn't even know that dragon fruit was a thing. Um, they just saw it on the side of a, you know, package deal. And so, you know, being able to provide those opportunities and spaces uh, was, was key and just a healthy living lifestyle, you know, exercising and all that stuff. You know, that's, I think that's something that church misses from time to time that it's not just about the spiritual health. It's about the physical and the food security and all those things that we can, you know, we can strive for. So. See. And this idea of, you know, I, I expand it out um, that uh, to the idea that obviously no one should leave, no one should leave God's house hungry um, in, a, in a spiritual sense when we're talking about communion, but that applies, that applies physically too. I mean, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're hungry, nothing else really matters. Um, you're, you're not going to be reaching higher spiritual planes or be all that concerned about the, 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 the complexities of theology and things that theologians are arguing about if, if there's no food at home. Um, and so those are, those are just basic, basic human rights. Mm -hmm. So, and 40% of the food that's produced in this country goes into landfills over 40% mm -hmm. of the food that's produced in this country goes into landfills. Um, which tells me that we're just not, it's, it's another piece of that brokenness that how can people be going to bed hungry in this country if 40% of the food that's produced winds up in a landfill? Um, and yeah, that's just mind blowing to me. Yeah, it is. It, and, and heartbreaking, right? Yeah. So it's yeah. heartbreaking more than mind blowing, just, just yeah. flat out heartbreaking. Yeah. So, uh, Kara, um, you want to remind us what the name of the book is and then where oh. they can, where they can pick it up? Yes, absolutely. So this is a time to grow Lenten lessons from the garden to the table and you can get it. Um, you can order it at, at your local book bookseller. If you have a favorite bookshop, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can get it from the publisher, Westminster John Knox online. Um, and you, you also can, if you want to get a copy from my website, um, I do have to charge a little bit more there because I don't get free shipping. Uh, so <laughs> 
<laughs> so I'm trying not to take a loss on the books. I actually don't get a discount on my own book. I know that's <laughs> kind of weird and people don't expect that, but um, so it is a little bit more expensive to buy it on my website, but those are for, for folks that wanted signed copies in my life that, that live further away, but right. um, we were trying to, trying to make that happen. So, so Kara, where, um, where, where's your website? Located? It is just karaedson.com. Um, and uh, so K A R A E I D S O N.com. And we'll have a link to that in a description of the book in our um, in our show uh, notes for this week. And we'll 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 put a direct link to her website so you can buy it from her website. But if you uh, need to pinch some pennies, we'll direct link it maybe on a couple others, maybe on a maybe on an Amazon site. So that way you can uh, buy it cheaply and get your free shipping. Or if you have you know, multiple books, orders, like I tend to, you can throw it all in that. <laughs> um, and so Kara, you know, we want to thank you for uh, being on the show and we will definitely have you back to talk about bunting strategies as maybe if the uh, MLB season actually does happen this year and we can talk about the universal DH, um, definitely conversations for other times. Um, mm. And as a Royals fan, I have lots of opinions. <laughs> yes, um, um, by the way, in 1985, he was still uh, he was out. So we will. He uh... was not. That is blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another topic for another day. Uh, but Kara, we definitely thank you, uh, we definitely uh, thank you for being on, and uh, you know we want to encourage people to pick up the book. Uh, if you haven't figured out a Lynn sermon series by now. I would encourage you to do this. Um, it was kicking me because she had approached me, but by then we'd already made our decision uh, as a team. And so like, I was like, Oh, this is, this is definitely an extra study. Um, and so, you know, I thank you for that and uh, encourage um, those that are listening. If you're looking for something, this will definitely be a good Lenten practice for you. Um, and if you're looking as, as a pastor or as somebody who's in worship leadership, there are also resources in the book for liturgy. Um, there are prayers already written out that go with each week and with each holy service, each holy day in Lent. Um, so we tried to make it a very, very accessible resource. Nice. Awesome. So, you know, thank you for joining us today, Kara. Um, Zach, do you have anything to, to bring us out as we bring us to the close? No, thank you for being on. Uh, I think this is a Gosh, it's, a, it's an important conversation and a, and a super deep practice that brings us closer to one another in the fullness of creation and God. So thank you. Uh, thank you for being on with your wise words and beautiful conversation. Thanks. Thank so, you guys. Um, you know, encourage you to go pick up our book. Check out our uh, podcast at beardedtheologians.com. We've got a lot of great content up. You can even buy a, um, you know, buy some gear, um, bearded theologians gear. I know Valentine's Day is Monday, but you could order it today and just have a nice little card with a picture in it saying, "Hey, honey," I, or "Hey, spouse," I uh, bought this for you, and it will be in shortly. Um, or if you need a coffee mug for your pastor or friend who loves theology, um, we have a few options for you. Um, and so just check us out um, at beardedtheologians.com. And so for the bearded theologians, I'm Matt Franks. Uh, I'm Zach Bechtold. Thanks for checking us out. I want you to subscribe and like this video and put that thumbs, push that thumbs up. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. You can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.